Good morning, good afternoon, good night, whenever you are watching this. Welcome to Mentor Mornings, my friends, where I share wisdom from people far wiser than myself to help you own your day and fuel your journey. Because life is a journey. The art of the argument, part three of five. Do you have people inside of your life? Do you? I'm sure that you do. And if you do, we use the tools of argument, the art of argument, every single day. If you have kids, you're using influence and persuasion and the art of argument to get them to brush their teeth, to put on their pajamas before bed, to eat their bloody food. Does anybody else have problems trying to get them to eat their food? If you, um, if you work with customers, then you are influencing and persuading them to leave your presence with a smile after interactions. You're using influence and persuasion to get your coworkers to cover your shifts so that you can go on vacations or honeymoons. So we use influence and persuasion and the art of argument. Hey, Bill, good to see you on your brother. We use influence and persuasion and the art of argument every single day every single day. So uh, knowing the art of argument, rhetoric, tools of persuasion and influence not only help you inside of your life in working with other people, but it also helps to recognize when those, ah, Dira, good to see you on here, brother. We're also using them, uh, or, or when we understand them, we can use those tools to recognize when people are trying to influence and persuade us. So these tools work twofold. They equip us to operate inside the realm of language and influence and persuasion. So many have speculated, and I think that it's probably, we could all probably agree on this, you guys, that we live in a three-dimensional universe. Like we, like our awareness is three-dimensional. But there are people have spoken about a fourth dimension, and that is time. And time affects everything. Marcus Aurelius wrote, time is like a river made up of events which happen and a violent stream. For as soon as a thing has been seen, it is carried away and another comes in its place. And this too will be carried away. So when we study how Aristotle broke down the art of rhetoric, he incorporated this dimension of time into it. It's kind of a broad concept, right? To, to think about we have our three-dimensional reality and then we have time. And time plays a significant role in the language that we use, its impact and influence. And we're gonna get into how we can use the mechanics of language to influence the outcome of how we speak to others, of how we speak to others. And how the, the what we want out of a situation can be influenced uh, and have a better outcome if we use certain language to get there. So when we look at the three core issues that we covered in yesterday's topic, like whenever we're getting into an argument where we want to influence or persuade, there's always going to be three core issues. That's what we spoke about yesterday was blame, values, or choice. And by the way, guys, if you appreciate this video, please hit that thumbs up button, share if you feel it is worthwhile, and subscribe if you are not already. So this pattern that we can see when we are looking at the three core issues is that blame always lands inside of the past tense. Always lands inside of the past tense. Values is always in the present. And choice is always, you probably guessed it, in the future. Choice is always the future tense. So, when we can revisit, when we revisit one of the things that we spoke about yesterday, the examples is who left the Legos on the floor? Ouch, ouch, who left the Legos on the floor? We're affixing blame. We're affixing blame on who did that. So um, Aristotle called this type of rhetoric forensic rhetoric because we're looking, we're trying to affix blame on somebody and its purpose is to determine guilt and then hand out justice, whether that be condemnation or praise, whichever. And a note about using past tense inside of any conversation or argument that we're having is that if you are a couple and you are looking for a positive result from the outcome, using past tense inside of it will only lead to blame, judgment, guilt, 
it, it, this is not a tool, using past tense is not a tool for having a positive outcome inside of that situation. All right, so now on to the present tense. So to convince somebody that forced vaccination is immoral, we use present tense. So should forced vaccination be legal? Would you mind if I took a needle and forced it into your arm right now? These are using present tense, and that's what we're using to influence that. So here's a, an example from Governor Steve Bullock, uh, the governor of Montana, one of his Facebook posts. He says, masks are our best tool to fight C-19 while keeping our economy open for the well-being of small businesses and each other. So notice how he's using present tense to create a value inside of the people that are listening. So present tense is an argument, uh, or present tense, Aristotle called a uh, demonstrative rhetoric. So what we're doing is we're demonstrating. It's used to bring people together or to separate them. To bring people together or separate them. Present tense is the, the tense that sermons uh, are spoken in. So it's the tense that uh, commencement addresses are spoken or you know, like funeral oration. Present tense creates a tribal type unity, either to bring people together or to break them apart, to focus on the qualities of the group or to focus on the inadequacies of another group. We always use present tense. So Jay Heinrichs, the author of Thank You for Arguing, he says, um, it gives people a sort of tribal identity. We're great, terrorists are bad, terrorists are cowards, and when a leader has trouble confronting the future, you'll hear similar tribal talk. So this is, this is the argument that we use to bring people together or to break them apart. This present tense. So now we go to future tense. Future tense was Aristotle's favorite method of rhetoric. This was his favorite place inside speech, and I'm sure you'll understand why. So to persuade an audience to consider going to space or building in space, we would talk in the future tense. We want them to focus on that choice. So like, should humanity build a colony in space? If we were to build a colony in space, we could experience blah, 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 blah. So like, we'll use Governor Bullock, uh, one of his Facebook posts is another example. He says, if we take this virus seriously, listen to government health officials and support one another, we will see the other side of this P word, which I'm not gonna say on here, and be even stronger than before. So he's directing us to make the choice to take the situation seriously. Um, so future tense, according to Aristotle, was called deliberative. We're deliberating on a possible outcome. We're deliberating on a choice. And uh, the reason why this is so effective is that it focuses us on an outcome. It focuses on a collective outcome. And then what is needed in order to get to that outcome? What are the steps that we're collectively going to go through to experience this universal outcome that's going to affect all of us? So focusing on future is the most effective way to resolve an argument. If we focus on past, we're just, we're just gonna be affixing blame on the other person. But if we use the future tense, we're focusing out here. There's no facts in the future. It's all just uh, expectations of what could be, speculation of what's possible, but there's nothing solid in the future. It's malleable. Okay, so any argument that, that contains a decision must use future tense inside of the way, the mechanics, the way that we speak about that. So to use these tools, guys, to use what we've covered so far inside of any argument or influence or persuasion that you are, are dealing with inside of life, the first thing that we need to do is establish your personal goal. What is it that you want out of the presentation that you're going to be putting out there? The second one is what is it, what is your goal for the audience? Is it mind, mood, or willingness? Do you want to inf impact something that they think? Do you want to create an emotion inside of them? Or do you want to create a willingness to act? That's what we covered yesterday. The third 
is what is the core issue? After you decided what you're gonna do with the audience, what is the core issue? Is it blame? Are we trying to find somebody that we're, we're trying to blame? Are we trying to influence values? Are we trying to create unity inside of a group? Are we trying to point out somebody that we want to tear down? Or is it choice? Are we trying to take them somewhere? Are we trying to influence the actions that they take going into the future? Is it choice? After you've selected your core issue, the fourth one, this is what we spoke about today, is select the tense that you're going to be speaking or writing in. Select the tense that you're going to be speaking or writing in. That's going to be what influ it influences without you even having to influence, just speaking that way. Just using those mechanics will influence the outcome and the effectiveness of what you're trying to speak about. So this has been the third of five, guys. Tomorrow we jump into number four, which is about actual tools just like this that we can implement into our speech, how we talk and communicate, the power of argument to create influence and persuasion, to soften up your audience, to create them, to be more malleable to what you're gonna be talking about. All right, guys, if you appreciate this video, please hit that thumbs up button. Help me get the word out there that this stuff is worth knowing. Share if you feel is worthwhile. And I will see you tomorrow on Mentor Mornings, my friends. Until then, rise unconquered.